I do want to make sure that we see your timeline, Billy. So why don't we, um, if, if you don't mind, we, we'd love to check it out. Okay. Do you see it? Yep. Okay. So this is unfortunately, it's kind of a hybrid of what way I would normally work. Um, <laughs> I know exactly what you're looking at. <laughs> yeah, this is the old uh, the old editor's cut, but it's it's kind of weird. I don't even know what it is. Um, so basically, the, the reason I'm saying it's hybrid is because of this and this. So what you're seeing here, and well, actually, let me back up a step. My normal workflow is that I have 20 tracks of audio, and I have what seven tracks of picture, and be it you know right here is your separator for picture and sound. Um, the basic rule of thumb for me is that I have four tracks of uh, production audio, and then I have four tracks, the bottom four tracks, um, these four are music. Those are, those are music, and these are um, production audio. And then all of these tracks, track, track five through 16, is effects sound effects and it's it's a gospel you never put and you actually well you can actually but you don't put you would never you would never do this you would never put dialogue down in an effects track unless you for creative purposes wanted that sound of the dialogue with echo to be out here maybe you do uh but for the most part it's almost never um so this is this is production this is sound and this is um sound effects uh, i'll explain these weird tracks in a minute because it's normally not like this and i'll explain in a second picture wise this is a weird it's not normally like this completely um tracks picture wise one two three and four when i'm first starting to cut um is uh camera negative and it's where I do all of my editing, and I'm very much into, I don't edit on one track, even though it looks like I do here, it's really not the case. Um, I put things underneath and constantly overlapping so that trimming is actually easy because I can just grab one thing and I can move it around very easily. It's just how I've worked forever. Um, it, it makes things, and I also checkerboard all picture is checkerboarded for the most part, and all dialogue is checkerboarded. So that if I have, let's just say, I have this, and I wanna make this tighter, it's, this isn't gonna work, but just so you get it, all I have to do is that. I don't have to trim this, I don't have to trim that. I just, and so one like happens on top of one another. It's just a way of making and having a, a maximum flexibility. The checkerboarding thing is really, really, important uh the other thing that i do uh is that i use how do i explain this i use multiple video tracks to play in alternate versions of a cut so that for example this is going to be kind of ugly but let's just use this as a test those are turned off so here's the cut that you know they're looking at those two edits right there that's great now let's just say I go to the director, hey, I have an alternate version. All I have to do is that. Now there's an alternate version. And I do this a lot. And I also do it if we've made a change. Let's just say this is the way I did it. Now the director comes in and now we do it this way. I don't get rid of my old version. Now I know I can get it in an old cut, but I don't get rid of it. I just put it here because oftentimes the director will go, hey, do you remember that version you had on that one line <laughs> where the dialogue was a little tighter? What do you mean, the one that we did five months ago? Yeah, that one. Well, I mean, I'd have to go back and look for it and oh my God, and I, all I have to do is this. Well, actually it would be this. Boom. You mean this one? And uh, it's great. And uh, and sometimes what I'll actually do is, even though this, the cut may be shorter or longer, it's really the in that I'm interested in. I'm interested. 
So even if I have to trim this side of it, it's fine. Okay. So now what's this weird stuff? This was the stem from the dub stage music, and this is the 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 uh the stem from the mix stage sound effects. So normally I would have all of this would be broken out, broken out, broken out. All of this is separated. So it's you know a million little clips. But once we hit the dub stage, I throw away all this shit and then they give me a new stem. So that's what you're seeing here is these are the stems from the dub stage. And I don't have a cut that I can find unless you can find it. Um, Russell, I don't, I think this whole cut is all stems. Yeah, this was, uh, this was, yeah, after we had, we had, it's actually yeah. sort of an interesting thing to see. You're sort of seeing how when you go to mix and then when you come back from mix, um, if things start to change, if the cut's changing, uh, now this is a weird like one. mix non you know mix and, and production audio hybrid so normally normally if if we've gone to the dub stage and they had mix I would have a stem for the dialogue and what would basically happen is that we would keep a version of this down here but these tracks would be turned off so you can't hear them because I need to be able to get back to the original production sound this would be as if this is the bad example but it would be kind of like that and then of course this would be gone this is the way this is what you would normally see this is your dialogue stem your effects stem your music stem and this, yeah, this is something that you really very rarely use but you have to keep it because the sound department needs it for their world yeah, so it's a big thing in the butt if i'm making changes here to uh, picture in this area, I have to make sure that the the invisible tracks also, whatever changes I make up here, have to be represented down here. And it is a nightmare. Uh, the other thing is that we would normally have, this is again, not real, but it just shows you what it is. You would have a picture stem up here, and this is the color corrected stem. And Russell would color code it to be a different color so it sticks out. But it, this and all of these represent the exact same thing. So this is color corrected, and all I have to do is turn it off, and I'm seeing the uncolor corrected image. So that's kind of a long kind of. So, so we do have a, a follow up sound question. How often do you send uh, your these over to the sound editor, or is it all done at once? Russell, so, yeah, yeah, that is a, that is that is. Uh, a, a very frequent occurrence and Billy's timeline is a good is actually a good example of you'll start to see as as we move into the finishing side of things you'll start to get what looks to be these redundant destructive tracks that you know we're getting them from mix and they are now baked and they have all the all the you know all the sound work done to them uh but they don't they won't travel back to like their source at all and you can start to especially with dialogue it's like if you don't if you're not keeping track of those lower tracks and making sure you have the original production audio, you'll really rapidly start to lose lines. And someone might say like, you know, this line, do you remember what take this is from? No, it's, no. it's gone to the, the nebulous void. There's no way to get back to it. Um, and so a huge portion of what we're doing in, at that part of the process as assistants is we are every time before it goes back out again, we're checking those and making sure everything is staying aligned, everything is still lined up correctly, and uh, it, the same goes for music to be able to track back music. Um, but that's all to say, yeah, the, we we will. Who? Actually, let me see if I have it up. I mean, we were turning returning those back over to sound. Uh, it, few it, really de cases. it depends on how much change has happened. Sometimes yeah. there'll be some changes. And I'll go, no, 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 I think some more stuff is going to be happening. Let's not turn over right now. So then yeah. now a bunch of the stuff changed. And you go, yeah, we need to turn over to sound because they need a, there's a lot of work to be done. So we'll give them the newest cut. And the same if is true have... with DI. They get the mm -hmm. newest cut. And the composer, the newest cut. Yeah, you but always want to kind of keep off to track. Uh, Especially when things start to shift in terms of your, if you open a shot up, it's like, oh, okay, the timing's changed. And now that's, 
you want to make sure they have everything they need. A lot of the times, from my understanding on their end, they're they're using they're using all that information more as a as a reference than anything. It just allows them to be able to look back and forth and see, oh, okay, like we're we're still aligned, we're all okay. So we have another sound question. How far along in editorial did you guys start to use stems and get stuff from the dev stage, et cetera? It's usually the preview. Whenever you're getting closer to your first preview, um, once you start dealing with stems, it's just a big pain in the butt. So I try and hold it off as much as possible, but usually the preview is, Okay, it's usually the preview. The exception would be if there's a massive scene, big car chase, and buildings are falling, then the sound department will give you a short stem for this one little three minute, five minute sequence, and you drop that in. But for so, the most part. So going back to, to what you were saying earlier, Billy, about, you know, um, having having the director ask you, hey, I remember, you know, a couple couple weeks ago, you showed me that one cut. Can we go back to that? In that same vein, what do you think uh, the best thing a director could do to incite the best possible work of an editor? Um, what are the main guidelines to have that, that optimal creative collaboration? Do you have, a, 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 are there any, are there any directors that you've worked with where you feel as though there's, there's a, a really solid flow between that feedback loop? Largely no, except a couple of years ago, I worked on a film with a French director and he would explain something that he wanted and I would, and I thought that I understood it. And then I would show it to him and he goes, no, 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 that's not it at all. No, 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 no. I go, really? I thought that is exactly what you, here's my notes. This is exactly <laughs> what you were asking for. He goes, no, no, that's not what I meant. Oh, okay. <laughs> so no, you know, it's been my experience. It's been my experience. Some directors are incredibly impressive on how well they explain things. And, and, um, you know, there are times where I have a very strange handwriting. They'll, I'll, I'll write the note down of what I thought the note was, and then I start to do it, and I go, I don't even understand what I wrote down, let alone what the note is. I'll <laughs> call the director, and I'll go, can you explain this again to me, because I really don't get it. Because if it's just a mechanical thing, like shorten this shot, eh. But if, if the director explains it on an emotional level, on why, or maybe he wants more pace, or maybe, then you're understanding what they're looking for, not the, the mechanics of a specific, you know, just make that shot shorter. Okay. So I know we're getting close to the end of our session here, and I know that there's a lot of aspiring editors and students and faculty in the audience. So I do want to pose this question to both of you. Uh, maybe let's start with you, Russell. Um, you know, what, what's the single best piece of advice you could give everyone listening today? Um, you know, how, um, if you could go back in time of to when you were first starting out, what do you wish you knew then that you know now? And, um, you know, I think a big one is uh, be excited about what you're doing and let people know you're excited. I think, I think like some people, I think, I know when I first started, I was like, keep, you know, you're, you're, it's like, you're being quiet. You're just doing, you know, you're doing your job. You're just doing, uh, you're, you're getting things done. Um, but, Oh dear. Uh, fire truck going by. But I think it's, it's too uh, bad. Yeah, okay. It's uh yeah, it's important to 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 you know you know make make clear that you know you're you're sort of you know you're excited to to be part of a project, you're excited to to you know learn, you're excited about the content of it and you know be interested in I don't know, uh, that that kind of that kind of thing I think is is is, is really important. Um, what else? Uh, I'd say the other ones. Uh, you know, uh, learn. Uh, I think another big one is you know be organized and kind of really learn strategies on on you know tracking to do items and really keeping track of what you're doing because you're gonna you're gonna be pulled in a million different directions and your brain will not handle it. <laughs> you will never keep everything you're trying to do in your head. It will fizzle and dissolve and yeah, so so 
really getting good at sort of tracking and task management. Important. Yeah, I second that. Organization is key. Billy, what about you? Um, I believe, uh, I feel very passionate about post-production. I feel very passionate about editorial and the entire process, be it sound, editing, all of it, because all of it is editing, all funneling together. Um, if, if editorial is your passion and editorial is where you want to go, be true to it. And don't, I, I, kind of a shitty thing to say is, don't use it as a stepping stone because you want to be a director or you want to be something else. Not to say that some people can't make that transition. You can, but largely it's the love of editorial. It's the love of post and the whole process, which I have never grown tired of all the time I've been doing this. The other thing is that I think to everyone who is coming up, try and be clear regarding what interests you. In other words, if you want to do commercials or visual effects or color correction or whatever, and also know the fact that you can change your mind and you can move in a different direction, but don't just say, oh, I want to be in editing. Oh, I want to be in post-production because I get, I do interviews with people all the time. Oh, I just want to be in editing. Okay. What do you want to do? What, what type of editing? You want to do sitcoms? Do you want to do drama? You want to do commercials? Doesn't matter. I can't help you if you're just vague. Be specific of what your passion is. Or more importantly, as you learn, you may decide, oh, I don't really like this. I want to kind of go in this direction. That's totally fine. But don't be vague. Be very clear of what interests you and be clear on what, what does interest you. You know, what drives you? What what causes you to bounce in the morning? Get up out of bed because you want to get to the edit room as fast as possible. Well, uh, I know we're at time and I think that's the perfect end line to close this session out. You know, what, what makes you want to get out of bed in the morning? And uh, hopefully it's editing after this. Um, Billy, Russell, I cannot thank you enough. This has been an absolute delight. Um, and uh, I know we can't wait to see Devotion. Uh, there's no, no uh, formal release date yet from, from what I understand, but um, hopefully we'll be seeing that uh, come out shortly. So everybody should check it out. Go ahead and support it. Um, and thanks again, Thank everyone. You, Thank you, we'll wrap it up. Have a great rest of your day. And uh, again, fill me to you at adobe.com if there are any questions. See you next time, guys. Thanks so much.